Okay, hello and welcome to another episode of Hiring and Inspiring. Today's guest is Jess Thomas. Jess is, well, firstly, I think uh, an old friend. We originally met and connected um, when I was in Tasmania a couple of years ago on, uh, on a hiking trip. Jess was leading the, the tour. Uh, she works and has worked extensively in the sort of travel and tourism industry. I'd describe her as a world traveler. She's been to many places, many more than me and uh, more than most. She's picked up a load of experience and a load of, um, I, I guess, I think life lessons along, along her way. So I'm really looking forward to catching up with her. She's also launched her own business recently, um, which I can't wait to find out a bit more about it uh, as well. Uh, and also just uh, catch up with Jess. She's a, uh, a really great person. So um, Jess, with that introduction, welcome to the show. How are you getting on? Thanks so much for having me, Joe. Um, I'm good <laughs> over in Sydney. It's pretty cold at the moment. Yeah. Also pretty cold in Melbourne at the moment, actually, as well. I imagine. Mm. So I'm, I'm really keen to catch up with you because I think it's been maybe a, a couple of years since we, we first sort of met and, and connected. I think since then, you uh, alluded to in the, the intro, you um, have started your own business, your own company. Um, from what I gather, it looks like a, a cycling business, uh, doing tours in India. It looks looks crazy. looks really cool. So tell me all about that. It's called Revolve Yourself. Is that right? That's right. It's called Revolve Yourself. And the idea of um, the name is directly related to the fact that it's cycle touring. So you're revolving and you're sort of evolving as well while cycling. And so the trips that we run, um, it's adventure tourism. Uh, and it's all, as much about the inner journey as it is about the outer journey. And so I'm a, I'm a really avid cyclo tourist and I, some people might not even know what that is, but it's pretty much, you take a, a good quality steel framed bike and you put two panniers on the back and you can cycle through um, all sorts of landscapes. And so I've ridden through like over 35 countries um, over the past 10 years or so. And uh, yeah, I guess through some really classic places like Australia, New Zealand and around Europe, and then started getting a little bit more left of center going to like through Central America and Asia, Southeast Asia. But India was just this country for me that was always um, like a little bit beyond the ordinary. And I'd traveled there as a backpacker, but never as a cyclo tourist. And I read blogs and it just seemed like too hard basket. I'd put it down, I'd walk away, but I was always like thinking about it. It was in the back of my mind. And then finally I got invited on a tour to India from someone that I really respect, the person who designed my bicycle. And so I went with him and one other guy. These guys, are, by the way, they're 70 years old and they're just totally incredible. One of them cycled 50,000 Ks through India in his lifetime. His first oh. trip was for six months when he was 18. So he really, he really knows how to do it. And so I guess in some ways he showed me the ropes originally uh, of cycle touring through India. And I was like, this is amazing. And just started going back with friends. I took my dad. My dad had never done any cycle touring, but that's not the point. That doesn't really matter. He was like one of those dogs that you put in the car and their heads just like dong back and forth. He was looking at everything and he was so excited. And I guess that was about five years ago. And I just realized I had to start a little business taking people cycle touring in India. And mm. yeah, I've just begun. And how long have you been doing it? Is it is, I saw you think you launched it last year. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a bit of a weather window. Um, so I launched it last year and I hung out for three months in India and ran the yeah. first two tours, which were 12 days each. And how, how do they go? Like how, you know, the first tours, how do they, how do they go? How do, what sort of feedback did you get from the, the clients? Thanks so much for asking. Um, the first trip was really fantastic. I was just walking on a, a dream, honestly. Um, everyone, I knew everyone somehow, like they were kind of friends of friends and things like that through social media. Everyone had connected after yep. I just kind of have been doing adventures like this for a long time. So the right people were there and we, we, um, we had an amazing time and there was a lot of space for, you know, India to come about and do its thing. And I guess the feedback that I got from the guests is that everyone's experience was just so different. Um, because everyone sees different things while you're cycle touring, like you're riding 50 kilometers. So that's a lot of ground to cover on average, 50 Ks. Um, so like quite literally everyone's trip is unique, more unique in some ways than, you know, when you're on a hike, when you cover less distance or maybe when you're in a car and you're pointing and looking at the same things together. The India cycle tour is just so random and obscure. And at night times we would talk about things that we'd seen and maybe no one else on the trip had even right. that particular thing. 
feedback from the guests was that three days feels like two weeks. So two weeks feels like months and months. It's a really um, jam-packed trip. Um, feedback from the first trip that we did is that we rode a little bit too much and a little bit, um, uh, yeah, so we, we adjusted that a bit for the second trip, which was good. Um, other feedback is that, yeah, people thought it would be chaotic and insane, but actually we felt really safe on the roads and yeah. this is the whole, this is the reason I'm taking people in India. I wanted to break down those barriers and boundaries, um, yeah. in our minds of this being like a chaotic country. It's organized chaos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what's the what's the route like? Whereabouts do you go in India? Say someone who's interested in listening to this, where where about where do you show them? So we cycle kind of like a 500, 600 kilometer loop around South India through Kerala and Tamil Nadu. So if you think okay. of India like um, the bottom of South America, it's kind of like Chile and Argentina with the Patagonia, and it's the same in India as well. They've got a one thousand six hundred kilometer mountain range that goes from like kind of Delhi down to the south of India. And yeah. so we get up into those mountains. We start in Kochi, which is the capital of Kerala, and ride down into the backwaters of Kerala and then slowly make our way up some really doable but high mountains um, into the tea and coffee plantations and also um, cardamom plantations of the, the highlands. And they're really pretty. It's where the English people used to hang out and um, spend time in the cooler weather so where they could handle it. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of colonial history. Uh, and then we make our way back down into the city, but we follow some really big rivers and it's actually a lot about nature, to be honest, which is not what even I expected when I first set out to make this route, but it's, it's just, um, yeah, there's some really beautiful national parks along the way, like yeah. the tiger reserve called Periyar national park. We stay there and go hiking and get off the bikes for a bit, but, um, in the future, like there'll probably be lots of routes, you know? Yeah. Okay, cool. And who's it sort of targeted at? Like who is your, I don't know if there's an ideal sort of person that would be suited for it or what kind of people are going to be going to get the most out of it, do you think? That's a really good question. I think I should explain that I have a colleague that I work with um, and she's a friend. Her name's Marie Louise. And so Marie and I met each other um, in Sydney about 12 years ago and we just connected. And she's kind of like a, an um, awareness activator. She's all about emotional intelligence. Um, she's written a book that helps nurses and people who might be going through lots of stresses in their life and helps them to manage their fears and kind of um, simplify the things in life. She loves meditation. She's a breath work instructor. Um, and Marie and I have been both been kind of like moving like this the last decade or so. And one thing that happened actually that really forged our friendship is that uh, I, I was off to university in Spain in 2014 and I had some time before needing to kind of arrive in Spain, like six weeks or so. And so I saw a cheap flight to Greece and I decided I would fly to Greece with my bike and ride through 10 countries to arrive at university in Spain. And I was going alone because, well, no one wanted to come with me. <laughs> and just 10 days before the trip, I was in a cafe in Sydney and I ran into Marie and it had been a year or two. And I, she asked me what I was up to and I told her and she walked across the road to the flat center and booked a flight to come with me and literally just joined me on the trip. So we rode through, yeah, all of the Mediterranean together. Um, and that was actually Revolve Yourself. We, we originally termed the concept oh. then. Yeah. Mm. So what I was going to say is Marie and I are running these trips in India together, which is fantastic. And she really brings a big element of breath work in the mornings. When we wake up, we do breath work, really sets the tone for the day and just keeps you calm for whatever might come your way. And we also do um, yoga. It's not all led by Marie, but she takes us through quite a lot of practices. And then we get um, Indian instructors as well, just to get that balance and experience um, Eastern yoga philosophy. And with these trips that are coming up this year, we're actually going to get off the bicycles and do sort of like a three day personal development um, time in Periyar National Park where we'll just like immerse, do lots of yoga and breath work and Marie will run us through some of her practices. So she's actually released a book called Worlds Within and yeah. I am always inspired by Marie. She's incredible. So um, in saying that, I'm really avid at the cycling and I've created this incredible route. I wouldn't change it. Like we just did it last time and it's amazing. So it's for people who love adventure, want to um, kind of get out there, have some fun, like a bit of a challenge. Cause you know, we're yeah. cycling 50 Ks a day average 
sometimes more, sometimes less. There's an opportunity to ride up a 25 kilometer hill one day. <laughs> mountain. It's a mountain. Yes. <laughs> um, and then people who also just really are interested in that inner journey, I guess, um, is it, it is a big part of it as well. So how fit do you have to be? Like, can anyone, do you need like a certain base level of fitness to sign up? Yeah. So what we experienced on the first two is that the people who came are not cyclists. They're people who just like to do activity that is fit generally. And they get a sore bum those first few days because they're not used to the cycling. But if you went to some RPM classes and just got on the bike a few times before the trip, I think you'd be okay, to be honest. But I think um, the real challenge is endurance. So if you like endurance but um, and a bit of heat because it is very hot in the south of India. And that's why that weather window that I was saying, like December through February, it's kind of like 32 degrees. And we manage the heat as best we can, but we cycle like 6 a.m. to midday. And then we're pretty much off the bikes in the afternoon in the heat of the day and we do other stuff. So you need to be um, keen, keen endurance wise. Uh, but not necessarily super duper fit or a cyclist. So it's someone who's likes a bit of adventure, likes a bit of activity, a bit of fitness, wants to see a bit of the world and also wants to just better themselves as a person on, on route. Yeah. I feel like you really catch that much more succinctly. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. So if I was signing up and I started you yes. know, day one, um, what, I don't, maybe, I don't, maybe it's not quite how it works, but like, what could I, that evolve concept, like how, what, what would I learn, do you think? Or not just me, but you know, anyone, what, what kind of, what, what, what evolutions have maybe some of the guests or clients had so far? What do you hope they learn and achieve from these trips? Yeah, I guess on the first day we sit down and we just talk about what our goals for the trip are because everyone's are vastly different coming from all sorts of backgrounds. And then, um, well, yoga and meditation and breath work really... Um, might not be a huge part of everyone's life, but I think what we do is try to offer some practices and repeat the same ones each day with um, the idea that they could be taken home and put into your to your daily routine, especially just like one or two breath practices in the morning when you wake up. It's just incredible how calm it can help. It can help. Well, for me, that's something that I really need, but, um, you know, for other people, it might be um, quite literally learning a flow of yoga. I'm a yoga teacher as well. And so I'll just take through like a traditional half of flow. Um, so you can take away sort of like wellness practices. And then in terms of what people are going to learn, we just have reflection time. I think that's pretty special. So we sit around together after dinner or before dinner because we are pretty tired after dinner. Um, and we just talk about what we've seen and what we've learned and maybe ask some reflective questions, um, which is maybe not something that adults do, uh, on kind in kind of their typical life. Uh, but that sharing yeah. and reflection ends up being a really big part of the trip. So I guess directed learning questions, and sometimes they come from the group as well. Uh, it's all quite organic. It's not sort of like a perfectly structured, um, linear thing, but People from the trip that have just passed, for example, they didn't realize that they could do what they did. They rode a long way on their bicycles. They were very impressed with themselves. Um, some people went home and changed their lives around quite dramatically. I got some phone calls after, which was not something I intended. It's just, you know, it's a result of doing something that was outside their comfort zone and I guess facing fears and pushing um, pushing outside the comfort zone again mm. yeah you're out here changing lives jess i love it oh no big days <laughs> <laughs> no it sounds honestly sounds epic i um yeah i, I want to sign up to it <laughs> yeah it sounds great it sounds yeah. sounds awesome sounds like you're doing um some really great stuff of it so we, we've talked about kind of what you're doing at the moment i really want to go into your background a little bit, bit, bit more and you know kind of how you've got to this point sure i know I hope you don't mind me descri describing you as a bit of a maybe a bit of a free spirit, a bit of a nomadic. You know, you've lived the last 10 years. Um, you've done a lot of traveling. How did that all sort of come about? Like how did you sort of, how did you get into that, that life, so to speak? I guess I've just been avoiding paying rent since I was a teenager. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was in the military, actually. I joined the military when I was 17, like the Australian right. Army. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay. 
Yeah, and so I was a sort of a regular soldier for a year and then went to ADFA um, after that. So the ADFA is the Australian Defence Force Academy, and so I was doing an arts degree through military university. Right, yeah, cool. Yeah, and then um, my dad, always throughout my whole life, he was a massive proponent of me being an officer in the military. It was I was from a small town, so everyone knew I was in there. It was kind of like a, it was a big deal, you know, and I... Um, I took it seriously, but my dad always talked about Nepal. So he went there when he was in his twenties. And so I was like, well, if it was so important to you, dad, I'd better go and have a look at this, like this Himalaya thing. And so I think I was actually, maybe I was only 19, turning 20 or something like that. And I went and did Everest Base Camp and the Annapurna Circuit. And I quite literally almost didn't get on the plane to go back home. <laughs> right. Okay. It was huge, massive. I'd never seen anything like the Himalayas and I'd never sort of, there was literally a defining moment. So I was out hiking in the mountains on Everest Base Camp and I, um, when you take this particular drug for high altitude called Diamox, you have to pee like 20 times a day. And so I was just doing one of my regular, very regular wheeze and I got lost. And it was like this glacial moraine kind of area um, with huge, big white boulders and like everywhere around you, literally the biggest mountains in the world. And so I couldn't see my group. And there's like, there's people walking over a space camp. It was Christmas time. So it was cold. There weren't as many people, but um, yeah, I couldn't see my group and they actually like sent out a little search party looking for me. And so I was probably lost for, it doesn't matter how long I was lost for, but in that moment I was like, wow, very, very easily. I could just slip away and be part of the rocks and you know the the world is so big and this this what I'm doing in this structured um kind of really conservative life of mine in the military is so um narrow <laughs> and I hadn't thought like that before and so I think the Himalayas changed my brain uh yeah so I went home and it took a while but I got out of the military uh and I started traveling and I traveled around the world for eight months and it was amazing on this Remember they used to have round the world tickets? Yeah, yeah, I bought one of those and um, just went for it and then came back and did a degree in international studies. And during that international studies degree, I just started cycle touring. So like when I was 18, I did my first cycle tour because with the money from the military, you can just buy toys. And so I like bought a nice bike and the pannier thing is that go on the back and did the great ocean. Yeah. But then I started cycle touring every, every big university holiday. Um, and it just, it grew into like this way of travel because when you ride your bike, you feel so connected to the place. It's just like hiking so good. And if you could hike more, like if we had five lifetimes, hiking would be better than cycle touring, but we don't. So cycle touring is the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Is that like your ideal kind of holiday or like that's your ideal way of traveling, the cycle touring? Yeah. I still dream about it. It's the best. Yeah. yeah. There's still so many that I'd love to do. Like the Pamir Highway is very famous yeah. in like Northern Asia. Uh, yeah. And um, the Carretera Austral in Patagonia would be an amazing way to get down there. Because like mm. when you're cycle touring, you're completely independent. Um, but when you're doing other type of travel, sure, maybe a motorbike would be really good too. But when you're with a car and you need to like find accommodation or when you're just like solo and you're hiking and you kind of need to work out alternatives like buses and things like that. I don't know. It just yeah. adds a lot of variables, but when you're with your bike, you don't need anything at all. Mm. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm. So question I was going to ask you, like, I think when, when I, when we first met, like something I definitely really just admired about you was your just energy and passion for life in general. Right. <laughs> Is that those sort of values that you had or, you know, it's, you know, have had, uh, how are they sort of, how, how did you get those? Or like what, what other sort of, what are, would you say your main like values and sort of things that you try and incorporate into your life as you go about doing what you do, being Jess? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it changes a lot as we grow, right? I think I'm at the point at the moment of just really valuing open-mindedness because in order to move through like this big wide world I feel the more open I can be to other people's varying ways of living and um, opinions the more enjoyable and like fluid my path is yeah yeah so that's massive and as you know I'm a guide so I face all sorts of personalities like you know next week I'm gonna 
be with a group of guests in the Flinders Ranges and I have no idea where their backgrounds, what they, or who they are, or what they're going to mm-hmm. do or say or anything like that. So if I can just be like <sighs> open, then yeah, it's life really, really enjoyable. <laughs> yeah, it makes things. Not, I don't know if easy is the right term, but like if you are, you have your own fixed sort of way of thinking about things. Yes, you'll be constantly just clashing with people, even if you don't necessarily agree, like agree with someone's point of view. Um, if you're at least open to it, I don't know. Exactly, it, it, inflexible. It, yeah. What, what else? What else would you say? You know, the main things you you live by, the main values you live by. Yeah, I feel like that um, kind of goes into another really big value, which is like flexibility, flexibility yeah. in style. Because as long as I am flexible and adaptable, then I can do lots of different things in this life as well. So at the moment, like. <laughs> At the moment, I don't know, but it's even worth talking about what I'm doing right now. But I'm a nanny and I'm house sitting and I'm dog sitting. And like on Perth, I'm just going to fly to, uh, sorry, on Friday, I'm flying to Perth and I'm driving a car across the country because that opportunity just came up three days ago. Yeah. And like I had to organize how to get all my stuff together really quickly. And I don't know. So like it's the game of um, just not having any rigid structures. But I feel yeah. like that actually really relates to the other value that I just said, which is like open-mindedness in, in like the way you approach um, situations, yeah. but also in your actual practical living space. Yeah. Like I feel like I'm just a blank canvas and I'll just go and do whatever, different jobs and yeah. different things. So if someone said, would it be like your worst nightmare if someone said to you, right, Jess, you're working at this job for the next two years. These are the hours you have to work nine to five or whatever. That's yeah. your job and that's your life. Stick to it. Well, that's that... funny. yeah, that's funny as well because that's my fear, like commitment. Except, right. I'm, like that's a challenge. So maybe that's where I need to be learn to be more adaptable. Yeah, <laughs> commitment. But that time, will yeah, come. fair enough. Yeah. Uh, do Do you like routines, by the way? Because no, uh, I just yeah. think the only routine I have. I think about it sometimes. Is brushing my teeth is like the only one. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, so I like, I, like I said, I really admire the way you like go about your life and live it, but I'm, I'm quite like a routine. Like I like knowing what I'm doing for my, my, my job, you know, I'm working these hours or whatever. I, I quite like that. I like it, an adventure. Don't get me wrong, but I, I don't know. I can, I, I need, I need structure, but that's just, I guess how everyone's different. Right. Yeah. Actually, you said this on an interview with, um, your friend who works at F45. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was, I remember your comment about his, how you said you like structure. And I was thinking about that for some part of that day about how everyone's so different in what we need psychologically. I need big structure, but I don't want like the, the details. So like, I love planning. It's like one of my absolute favorite things. Um, this is like a dangerous pastime. Hey, cause most of it doesn't end up, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's like joyful to think about all the things that you could get up to but i don't want to know the details what do you mean like big structures that mean like at least you know say you've got those tours to india next year kind of thing is that what you mean yeah exactly i like yesterday i just played around and wrote all my goals for 2024 and then like roughly where they might fit in can we hear some of them sorry can we hear some of them some of the goals oh sure sure i thought i might just i was thinking that um at the moment i have some really big cycle touring goals and uh in my, in my mind, I think, wow, well, they're my goals. They might be over the next 10 years. I can get them done. But then I realized that my goals might change in the next few years. And then I might not get my current goals done because I might change. So I should probably just yeah. do them as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I want to go and hike those two massive cycle tours that I just told you about and hike, yeah. the, um, hike the Georgia Translution Trail. Looks incredible. Um, and I just want to cycle Northern India. So Leh Ladakh, which is kind of like way up North on the border almost. And so that's just big. It's just beautiful mountains. Cycling through beautiful mountains is like my, my jam. But I, I was also thinking I may as well just cycle them and then do a second trip with, with guests yeah. on each of them. Yeah. So it would be a huge 2024. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to touch upon is you on your Instagram, you post a lot of the lessons, right? The life lessons you've, you've learned over the years uh, from your travels and experiences. One bit 
caught my attention a lot was when a year or so back when you turned 30 right mm -hmm. and you posted a bunch of lessons that you learned at 30. It's on my mind because I turned 30 in a few weeks <laughs> so and I've been thinking about it I've been thinking about this kind of stuff a lot um out of I think you posted a bunch of lessons at that time can you remember like which ones let's say were I don't know the most important to you or the, the biggest lessons that you've learned at that time that you you still feel uh you know you still hold on to at this it's point relevant yeah yeah so just a, a little bit of context at that time um i was living on lord howe island and i was working as a hiking guide and it's a very peaceful island so i had time to write like 30 life lessons <laughs> before turning 30. which yeah. by the way was so cathartic um and so you and i actually chatted about this like the other day as well so i thought i would just go back through and have a look and the ones that um resonate the most at the moment one one's about owning it and so okay. i'll just read it they're not very long um is that cool yeah of course yeah okay okay lesson five of 30. you've done okay so it's called own it you've done so goddamn much seen the world lived a thousand lives if you downplay yourself you're devaluing your very precious life experiences don't be afraid to be honest. Don't hold back to make people feel more comfortable. We're walking in the footsteps of suffragettes, activists, free thinkers, and freedom fighters. Be bold, love your life. Be proud of the special moments in your mind. Share your dreams, share your rawness. When you express yourself in this world, practice authenticity. It will nourish you and contribute to a progressive global society. Let's grow fields of tall poppies. The ordinary are the extraordinary. Take care not to limit your capacity. So that's pretty much be yourself right don't try and be someone someone else you know i think i think a lot of people including myself maybe and others like they especially when you're a bit younger you play you play a bit of an actor right you try and be someone you're not when you actually own who you are it's a bit it's a bit more liberating totally and i like that that's what you take from it as well because i feel like we would all take something different i think for females um and i don't want to generalize but we often have a lot of self-doubt and we just we just need to step into our like our confidence a lot mm. yeah and even just writing something like that i'm like oh god it's so it's so naughty to be saying be confident but that's the whole point yes, yeah. <laughs> but i like that that's um yeah 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 that's anyway any others any others sure um the next one is about something that came from all the amazing guests that i've had you're one of my okay. amazing guests right and here we are so it's stay vibrant I meet a lot of wise humans on walking weeks who aim to impart their life learnings while sweating up mountains. Their penultimate lesson is to do what you can when you can. Use your time thoughtfully and pack it all in. Never feel too under the thumb. Experiences matter. Love and family are the big players and diversity is key. But the thing I really take away is the fire within. The sparkly people I want to emulate haven't lost touch with their deep curiosity, far beyond their fifth decade of living. They listen in wonder, absorb like sponges, have obscure hobbies, smile for the sake of the world, and just give back so much delightful energy. Life inev inevitably has its ups and downs for all humans. What will your reaction be to your world? I would like to keep moving forward in softness, in touch with my wide-eyed inner child. Yeah. I think, I think what I'm taking from that is you can learn something from anyone or you know at least have the open-mindedness that you can always learn you know learn be always be learning right you can always you're never quite the finished product this every person you meet this whatever position that whatever work they do whatever their stage of life they're in you can always learn from them is that right yeah yeah totally and that like you are the person learning that is the whole point like you're just curious to learn yeah have you always, have you always been curious like a curious person i think so I guess if I feel like I'm in a depressive mode, I'm not a curious person. So I guess curiosity is like when I'm vibrant. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I'm still inspired by other people's curiosity, especially like I say, people, older people, it's like, wow, they're retired and they can just relax, but they're just learning. They're still learning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, like my uh, shout out to my grandma. She's nearly 90 and she's always, she's watching like, um, you know, she'll spend her days watching documentaries on some thing happened you know 200 years ago and she's you know burning up notes and fascinated by it and it's like how much do you still need to learn like but she's still uh yeah, yeah it never it never ends i think 
that's so beautiful. And I guess that's the point of life, right? Mm. One, one of your, sorry to jump in at your lessons, but one that stood out to me yes. that I remember, I think it was titled um, something like, this is not a dress rehearsal. Ah, cool. Yeah. That was what resonated to me. It's like, shit, like this, you only get one shot at this. <laughs> so make the most of it. Like, don't waste your days. I guess you don't want to get to a point where you kind of look back with regrets on, fuck, I wish I lived that a little bit more, or I wish I'd done whatever. You know, is, is that, was that the point of that one? Do you remember that one as well? I think it was something like, here it is. This is not a dress rehearsal. You never know if your next move is going to be a game changer. Keeping you on your toes for the magic slippery dip of life. By the way, I'm clearly, I love words. <laughs> Dipping and laughing and gliding our way around the sun for better or worse on this daily learning journey that just is. May as well have fun with your own company along the way. Laugh at the moments that aren't funny. Step outside of your body and take a perch. Watch yourself interact with the wild ways of the world. Once you're too comfortable and time is running through you, jump in some new direction. Scream more, scrunch up your identity, help someone out. Delve within, look up from this post and see. That's all you need. <laughs> That's cool. That's the one that got you. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Um, one, one thing I was maybe thinking about is like, obviously, these are lessons you've learned at 30. Right? Yes. Did you, yeah. did you sort of know this stuff when you were 20, say? Are the, how, when did you pick these lessons up? Were you, I don't know, are, are these something that you would love? Would you love yourself to have known these at? At, at 20 or are you happy you didn't know them at that point and you've not experienced them? Yeah, I definitely didn't know a lot of these lessons at 20. That's for sure. Yeah. Maybe 25, but yeah. um, gosh, I don't think that they would have made sense right at that time for yeah. us. Cause you have to go through life experiences and breakups and like big trips and boredom and, yeah all the life things. And I also had this funny thought the other day because a lot of these I learned from one person in particular, sort of like, well, I read I read Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, but I also oh, have yeah. a person in my life that's incredible and has kind of imparted lots of those similar lessons on me. Um, and I thought this is like intellectual property that I'm potentially breaching on their behalf. And then I laughed and I'm like, no, these are just the lessons of being a human that we all <laughs> have access to and can like write about and you know contemplate yeah. and they'll only grow i guess if we keep growing uh like it'll be cool to do this every decade actually uh, yeah that was what i was going to ask actually <laughs> i know you need a bit of a crystal ball for this but what do you think i don't know what do you think say you'll be think where, where do you think you'll be at maybe when you're 40 next you know 10 years yeah i think i'd expect myself to write a book by the time i'm 40. Okay. And one of my life lessons is no expectations. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, gosh, we can all write a book every decade if we wanted to. I think that that's not a huge deal. But, yeah, for me personally, I think that I'd love to write. And the reason that I would do it is because um, – I have learned that the world is a really beautiful open place and I would like to write a book about how that is and mm. share it. Well, I'll be staying tuned for that and uh, be uh, <laughs> definitely picking up a coffee, Jess. Um, Thanks, Joe. What you mentioned about before, about um, sort of that fear of commitment, say, and then you may be maybe settling down or something like that. I can't remember what you said. Mm -hmm. It will be... That's for the future. I know that's not an easy question to answer, but like, when do you think that might be? Or like, what might need to happen for you to have a bit more of that sort of settled really? life without a better word, better word, really? I guess that, um, you know, our lives will just change over time with our values mm. and our, as we get older and um, naturally just calm down a little bit, I see. Yeah. I look at my parents because we don't have that many uh, older sort of consistent people in our lives, except for our family. Um, and I just see that they're so chill. They're so happy, just loving the coast where they live and their dog and the beach and having structure. And, um, my dad was a traveler like me in his twenties. He just had uh, a motorbike and a ute. I think that was all he really owned and traveled around Australia and Europe, sorry, not Europe, Asia. And now he's so content 
going for a walk with the dog, swimming at the beach, um, just eating his muesli and looking at like the trees. So <laughs> that that will come for me too eventually, yeah. but it's not yet. I just can't do it now. Yeah. You, you, you don't know when, right? That's, that's what's pretty cool no. about life. You just no, you don't know when. <laughs> but every time you t talk to older people who have lived, right, like they lived more time in life than us, they say it'll come. Like d don't need to will that time away. Like, um, oh, classic quote. Is it, I, maybe you know this quote, what's for you won't pass you. No, I don't know that. No. Okay. I like that one. No. What's for you won't pass you. So yeah. I've um I've probably got one more question for you. This Thank is my you. typical closing question. Um, around, and I ask all my guests this: what what it's around the idea of success, and this can be personal, professional, whichever way you like. What does success mean to Jess Thomas? It's a good question, isn't it? I think success is figuring out what your truth is and then living by it. Mm. And that's apart from society and all the nurturing <laughs> that you've had throughout your life. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so like scoop yourself out of every situation that you that you know and figure out who you are or what it is that you um, are. And then, yeah, live in line with your values, I guess. It, that truth, does that mean like your purpose? Is that what you mean? Like what you're sort of meant to be doing kind of thing? Is that what yeah, maybe maybe per maybe if you're looking at meditation and stuff like that, then per there is no purpose. You're just living. Right. But um, I do think that we all have values and priorities that are unique to us. So I've worked with like really cool in development organizations and they give you say 200 values and you get to have them written down and like they're all on little cards and you pick out your top 21 um, things like, you know, major values in your life, for example, love or um, family or um, travel or gr personal growth. And then you narrow it down to seven and then they make you narrow it down to three and you know i've done this a few times over the last 10 years and they're always the same three values i can't remember exactly what they are this second but um i guess the next step after that after recognizing what your values are is to see if you actually prioritize them in your life in the way that you live so like having congruence through your values and your actions and if you're doing that then i think that it would be very good for your soul and i guess effectively you're you're successful for yourself yeah i love that like that the stuff about the values i think everyone well not everyone but like a lot of people think about what their values are and they might say yeah these are my values like even companies businesses these are my values but like whether you actually live them or like you know do you actually action them that's pretty i don't know that's yeah that's just made me think so mm, yeah. um just that's um a load of great stuff there a load of great wisdom for anyone listening <laughs> hope you uh, learn a lot from from that if someone going back to the start your your business at the moment if someone wanted to reach out and get involved in one of your trips or what you're doing um, with revolve yourself how would they do it well a good place to follow us and just get in touch is just jumping on um my instagram so it's jess underscore revolve yourself and you'll see all the links to just well you can just message me and you're on board yeah. <laughs> we've, yeah. we've got many spots left in december we've got like three seats left um literally seats on bikes and yeah but there's the january trips not full and then if that fills we'll probably um open some other ones but we're just keeping it pretty small and organic at the moment um and having fun with it like we're not taking it too seriously yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but Amazing. thank you joe and we met walking in the mountains which is effectively like what we do in the india cycle touring you know we're, we're cycling next to each other in beautiful locations and look we've maintained a relationship and i don't know like it's just a really cool way to connect with people connections are best yeah, absolutely just appreciate you coming on appreciate your time and uh, sharing your journey and your wisdom. Thanks a lot. I'll talk to you soon.
Thanks for the invitation, Joe.